singing was very encouraging, um, also very happy to see everyone back and to uh, see everyone, good to see the temple and others as well. Um, yeah, happy new year everyone. Alright, we are going to turn to the book of Thessalonians. This is the book that we'll be doing today. In fact, the portion that U- Unoa read is going to be our attention for today. So, if you're there, at First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm just going to read that text again. Um, I'm reading from First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 15, even though our focus will mainly be on 12 to 14. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourself. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays... uh, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning that we are able to come together to turn to your word. Uh, We pray and ask, Father, that you speak to your people. Um, You are the only one who can minister to their hearts. I uh, pray that you will use me and you will open their heart to your truth, to search this truth together. In Christ our Lord. Amen. We are still doing the book of Acts uh, here as a church. So just because me not today, I'm just coming for today. I just pick a random book. But um, I'm glad that it's also a, very, a book that is very close to what the book of Acts is doing. And if you have been seeing what we've been learning from the book of Acts, really it is the establishment of the church. Uh, we see uh, at the beginning when Jesus left and the apostle came and the church began to grow in villages after village. In fact, one of this book that we are reading today, the book of Thessalonians, is also one of the churches that you, as you read the book of of Acts, you find it was one of the churches that was started there. This is a very, very, very good book. I remember some years ago, there was um, uh, our pastor back then, when I was still at Muratani, Pastor Patrick, he, he, he came with a book. Um, that book um, had all the books of the Bible. Uh, we call it a Bible overview. So it had all the books from Genesis to Revelation. And it will write the name of the book on top, it will say Genesis, and it will write a theme that when you read the whole book, you will find that this is the whole idea that is repeating. And as we were looking at this, we were young, young, young guys at church, very excited about it, because we look at the confidence, we look at that uh, 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 copy, and we said, now we're going to understand the whole Bible. And, and I went, as I was going through, I came across the book of First Thessalonians, and I saw First Thessalonians, and it wrote the exemplary church, the example church. As, 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 as I read, I, I was reading with this in mind, trying to see, is this really what I'm going to find as I read the book of Thessalonians? And boy, whoever wrote the book was, was not missing. He was very much on point. The, the book of Thessalonians, when you read it, you get the idea that when the apostle and God, when they started the church, how does that church look like in their everyday life? This is one of the books that will help you to understand that concept, to really appreciate the church. This is what we've been doing when we're teaching the book of Acts, to get us the idea of where the church comes from, what the church had to deal with and continue to deal with, and 
also how the church should look like. The early church is not just the example of how we do church, but it is um, the skeleton of how we do church. We, there is no way that we can come and say, oh, we saw X, we saw what they were doing, but we want to start our own thing. We just build on what was there. So the book of Thessalonians is a very good book. I want us to go very quickly to the book of Acts, as I was saying, to see as this book was, as this church was being established. And we'll go to Acts 17. There's a lot of verses. Some of them I'm not going to uh, uh, read with us as we go. I'm just going to, uh, or, or let us read. I'm just going to quote them as we go so that we, we don't spend too much time. But I want to, as you will see, even from the book of Acts, what were some of the, of the ingredients that really made this church exemplary? And I want us to pick those things as we go. And I want us as TCM, as we have met today, to start to think of ourselves as a church based on these things. Amen, church? That is the task that I want to do with us today. So let us turn to Acts 17. I want to go to Acts 17. And we'll read from the very beginning. If you're reading from the ESV, it says, Paul and and Silas in Thessalonica. This is the book that we're learning. All right. Now, when they, I'm reading from 17 verse 1, when they had passed through Amipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of Jews. And Paul went in as it was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and did a great many of devout Greeks, and not a few of leading of the leading women. But they were jealous and talking some and taking some wicked men of the rebel, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason seeking to bring them out of the crowd. Now, there's a lot that is going on here in a very short space of verses. But I want us to get this idea that Paul came to Thessalonica. There was a a thing that he does. He would first spend time with the Jews if there was a synagogue, and then he would go to the Gentiles. So as he was with the Jews, he was reasoning with them, showing them that, that Jesus Christ, who just died, is in fact the Christ the one that they were waiting for. And as you read going down, it says some were convinced, and what did they do? They joined Paul and Silas. So I want to highlight something here. In fact, when you read in the next verses, Paul gives some sort of a commentary of what was happening. Let's go to Acts chapter, sorry, to Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to go to chapter 5. Paul here on chapter 1, we read what happened. He went to the synagogue. He explained everything. Uh, he told them about Jesus. He told them that he is the Christ. And in Thessalonians chapter 1, those people believed the gospel. When they believed the gospel, some people were jealous of that. They didn't like this idea that now people are starting to worship Jesus. And, and the idea, the reason for that is because Thessalonica was like the, the heaven of idols. Okay, uh, it was such Thessalonica was in such a way that if you come from Thessalonica and you don't worship idols, we would be surprised if you've been to Thessalonica. Uh, I don't know what is the thing here in Mamilodi that is so common that if you don't do it, you probably would question if you come from Mamilodi. No, that's not true. Uh, I remember when I was with some of my sisters, we were talking, and we were talking about Pumi, and they were like, Pumi, you come from Mamilodi? They're like, yeah. 
that you don't look and sound like someone from Amino. But I know about Harangua. I don't know if you guys know a place called, called Harangu. In Harangua, I worked in Roslin and I worked with a lot of guys from Harangu. If there's anything that people from Harangua love and are very good at is Furatabukle. It's just a common thing. People by ba- Harangua, they're always trying to dribble you. Even at work, they're trying to make you do more and they have an excuse. They'll be like, ah, no, we're going to buy food whenever you can finish it. I was like, it's, it's, it's nine. We, we go to lunch at 12. What are you talking about? So it was a thing. Even most of us, we were like, oh, I think the other thing, as I was asking another colleague of mine, and uh, because I was very curious, or what about people who are What do they like? He's like, what do you like? It took me time to understand what that means. But this is the idea that the Thessalonian was so drenched in into idols that this was their identity. So when Paul came and preached Christ, he was literally creating a new man or the spirit of God when it comes through that message created a new man. And this frustrated the leaders in Thessalonica. They were like, "Uh uh-uh, this is not going to happen. Not in our watch. We, we get to see this thing that the gospel does when it is preached. It begins to create enemies. right? So th- th- this is what happened in that church. But let me go back to, as I've given you the idea. In Thessalonica chapter 1, all that thing that happened when they believed and followed Jesus, Paul gives us a commentary here of what was really happening. I'm going to go through it very fast. I'm going to read chapter 4, verse 1 from, uh, chapter 1 from verse 4. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel, what is the gospel in this case, from what we have learned when he went to Thessalonica? What is the gospel? Anyone encourage me if you're listening? (laughs) What is the gospel? When Paul says, remember, Paul is interpreting what happened. What is the gospel according to Paul? Right, some murmuring are saying Jesus. That's that's close to the answer. But... Sorry, the gospel is Christ. Okay. Sorry, believing in Christ. All right. All right. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is. Yes. Sorry death and resurrection of Christ. Because the problem that, that the Jews had, that's what Paul emphasizes, the Christ. They couldn't get, if he was the promised Messiah, why did he die? He couldn't get that. So Paul was emphasizing that he had to die, and that was the Christ that uh, God uh, had prepared for you. So I want to go real quickly here, because our gospel, that message, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, not o- came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. So when the message has been preached, the Holy Spirit is also working other things. It is working in our heart to convince us and to show us our need for Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You remember there was a lady called Lydia. Uh, the Bible says, as Paul was teaching, the Holy Spirit opened their heart. Now, we can come here and preach you the gospel in so many ways, in so many languages, but until the Holy Spirit of God moves into your heart with power and conviction, it will just sound like stories. It will just sound like stories. So, it came in power and conviction, in the Holy Spirit, full of conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you, and you become imitators of us. So not only did they believe the gospel, they forsake the idols, but they, become to, they begin to live life like the apostles. For you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. All right? So you become an example, that is the word. You become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Not only for the word of the Lord, not only has the Lord or the word of the Lord sounded from you, forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth. 
So this is a huge replacement. So people who were into idols, now they were known in Macedonia and Achaia that they trust God. Their faith was the thing that was known. Really a transformation of a city by the message of the gospel. He says, For they themselves report concerning us what kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned from God, how you turned to God from idol to serve the living God and to wait for his son. So these are the are the are the work that happened. They there were true transformation that happened. Um, there's a the, the the idea that I, that we see is that the the gospel came to Thessalonica and created a new people. Or the gospel, if we can use this way, creates the church. I don't know if that makes any sense. The let, let's read. Someone please read for me from um, uh, First Peter chapter two verse ten. First Peter chapter two verse ten. If you're there, please read First Peter chapter two verse ten. First Peter chapter two verse ten. And once you were not a people, that's, that's the one, right? Yes. And once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, for those who have received the gospel, it says once they were not a people. So they were not a, a people. Is not one person, right? It's a group of people. They were not a people. What happened? Continue. Please repeat that verse. Once they were not a people. But now you are God's people. Now you are God's people. How does that happen? How do you go from just being individual who come here every Sunday to being a people? What does the second portion say? Once you had not received mercy, but mm-hmm. now you have received mercy. That distinction, that receiving of mercy is the work of the gospel. So the gospel is the one that takes people who are apart and makes them a church, right? So at the, if we say we are part of this church, the main question will be, do you believe the gospel? Have you believed the gospel? We are not the church in Mamilodi because we are here in Mamilodi, or we are able to come to Mamilodi. We are a church of God because all of us have received mercy and God has made us a people. The same way that the Thessalonians had the gospel and they forsake their idols, they forsake their idols and have this new identity in Christ. So this is the work that God is doing. So in the whole book of Thessalonians, you would see this constant term, this constant repetition where Paul is talking about the gospel as the source or the creation, the, the one thing that creates the church. I know we can, we, we can, it's easy, like I was saying, we can think that a church is because of what we have in the or, or, or we are black or whatever, and even, even worse, there are churches that are built on, on an identity that is not the gospel. It, it could just be I don't know if there's anyone here who comes from Zimbabwe, but they have their own church, which is very unique to them, right? Which is also very common also in my Venda brothers, which is, we have a church which is ours, you know? It's, 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 this identity is built on us as a people, not, as, not from the message of the gospel. That is the one thing that tied. So, I don't want us to be discouraged as we read this and think, they is the gospel that is supposed to make us this type of people. And, and obviously we can look at ourselves and think we're probably not there yet. Because when you look at the book of Thessalonians, it says they were filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Not one of them, but the whole church was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They, they were enduring the suffering and, and when we talk about the example church, I, I didn't want to quote this to discourage us, but I wanted to highlight some of the things that are very important so that we can have them as our goals and ambition. All right, so let us, let us move into Ephesians chapter 5. And I want us to see something which is where we probably will dwell. In, 
First Thessalonians chapter 5 since the gospel has called us into one another the gospel basically is if anyone is able to walk through this door and hear the gospel and believe it we could say they are literally forced into our lives by the spirit of God I don't know if that makes sense like if someone believes the gospel and they commune here with us on an everyday on, on, on every Sunday they are forced on us. So now when we think about ourselves as a church, we think of ourselves with them in mind. Right? It's, like, um, it's like getting married. It's very exciting because you're marrying someone you know, but if you get married two months into the marriage, you realize that your wife or your husband has some habits that you don't like. Well, because you're married, you're literally stuck with them. I love to use that word. You're literally stuck with them. Like you, you, you don't say, ah, Mara, you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. It's too late. It's too late. Like when you're married, your partner's flaws, they are yours to commit. If your, 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 your partner, you feel like he's slow, that is your slow man or slow woman. If you feel like your partner is impatient, that is your impatient puppy. You're stuck with them. Why? At least with marriage, we make the choice, or I, nah, I want that one. Well, it's not like they were put on a pedestal, but you, you get what I mean. You, you make your own choice. But with the church, who knows here, as we preach the message of the gospel, who's going to receive it with faith? Who knows? Who knows who the Spirit of God is working into? Who knows? Who knows when we got out the street there and preached the message, who is going to receive it? And we say, hey, you need to come here. Maybe the gospel might just bring your worst enemy into the church. Some years ago, I remember a brother of mine who was converted. And some years later, as we were in church, another lady came into the church. And is like, oh, I remember this lady when I was still an unbeliever. I used to harass her, you know. I called her names and do stuff. And he had to go, because they still know each other. It's not like the gospel made us for God. They still know each other. And he had to go and apologize and start off the new relationship on the basis of the gospel. So the gospel is bringing together a community of the unlikables. Right? There are people who will visit your home, and to use the word of Noah, and eat your food, who you never thought in your life would have been in your life. So let's just appreciate that. Let's just, let's just let that sink in. Or God is building his community. I know these three are good friends, right? But, and they, they're good to, it's easy to influence one another. Let's go to church, and that's good. And it's good when three of them are in church. That's good. They remind each other on an everyday Sunday. But it's not always God bringing friends or a trio of friends. God is going to bring His people because God is building His church. And what we're going to read from this text is that those people that come into the church, they have problems. They come with issues. Some of them are stubborn. Alright? This chapter, as it talks about the exemplary church, I don't want us to think that it is exemplary because everyone is so good and so perfect. Come on, we are TCM. How many of you can raise their hand that they are so good and so perfect? None of us. The truth is, we sit here in this seat and we continue to enjoy fellowship and we continue to do our life because on an everyday basis, those in the church, they are bearing us. Amen? I don't know if I'm discouraging you, but... I, I didn't want to give you the idea that you're amazing. Some of you are, are very funny people. You're, you're so funny. You are likable. But you have sins in your heart and in your life. And God brought you. When you come into the church, you are raw. Like you, you, you know nothing about how to walk with God. That's why you need pastors and teachers and others to, to guide you and to teach you. But even though... <laughs> 
you, 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 you will at one day agree with, yeah, it's true, I'm a sinner, but you are stubborn, you don't need correction. And that stubbornness is something that other people need to carry in the church. All right? So my point is that the gospel message establishes the church. The coming together of the church is built by people who are not the same. All right? Some of you, we met here in church, but we are such good friends. All right? Some of you, we met here in church, but we're still working on that relationship. Okay? That's where we're going. So there are problems in the church. And as I was saying, that when we come to church, we are wrong. Um, there's a... I love soccer, and one of my favorite teams, probably one of the best teams in England, Chelsea. Okay? Don't, don't comment, I'm speaking here. Okay. <laughs> Chelsea, all right? They, they had a new owner who left because of the war in Russia and got a new owner. Exciting. And they bought a lot of young players. But they're struggling to win and to connect these young players. And these players are top, top, top talent. But they're struggling to win games. Why is that? And I heard one other guy when he was explaining. He said they are too raw. They're too raw. The skills are there, but they don't have the... You know, like Lionel Messi, for example. You know what makes Lionel Messi good? It's because he's smart. He, is, he, is, he can read the game. He can calculate. He knows when to move forward, when to move. When He knows this thing. He's good at it. But most of our Chelsea players, they're very good, but they, they don't know how to calculate, when to make a run. There's a lot of offsides if you watch Chelsea games. Because they run too fast before the ball is kicked. Someone kicks the ball and throw it over there. No one is there to connect. Messi is very good at reading those little things. That's what makes him one of the best players in the world. So we come to church. We're like Chelsea players. We're very raw. We're not, we don't know how to live in community with one another. It is something that we need to learn. And we need to know that church, that the person that sits next to you is raw and is a work in progress. But we also need to be honest with ourselves and say it with your chest and say, Me, Nkumbuleni, I am wrong. Okay? I will offend people. All right. So I'm going from where the gospel and God is doing his own thing, building the church, to the very practical now as those things come together. God is not just going to convert us and, 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 and we're going to be these amazing believers. It takes time. Spiritual growth is very slow and it's very painful. It takes work. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of other people being involved in that. That's why if you leave this here and maybe go to study or work somewhere else, please find a church of other people who also have been, believed the gospel and have been made one, who meet together because they are one in Christ. And say, hey, me too, man. I, I believe the gospel too. They're like, oh, come. You're raw. Let's go. All right? It's a bit like marriage. Marriage is a good example to make. Um, uh, there was a pastor that I was reading, and he says, um, if you're going through a tough time in your marriage, there are two options. You can quit, or you can hold on. Right? And he says, what I can tell you, with hanging on, over time, things eventually get better. Well, what he said was quite obvious, but <laughs> I was interested when he was saying it. He says, all those people who will endure will be fine at the end. And I was like, yeah, because they, they stayed. But he's like, yeah, they'll be fine. And what I was trying to hint on is that growth, even in marriage when we don't understand each other, I don't think, okay, I don't think a lot of time, uh, uh, Many people, uh, can you raise hands so that I speak in a community here? I don't want to speak alone. Yes, I say to me, okay. Can we all agree, married people, that when we fight with our partners, it's not necessarily that we don't love them, right? I think we love our partners, but we are raw. We have a lot of mess, right? We often fight about things that are not worthy of a fight. 
I don't want, my wife doesn't like it when I give an example about it, so I'll give an example with me. Sometimes I'm just frustrated with my wife, and my emotions are all over the place, because she's picking for me what I should wear. I was like, I got it, babe, I got it. And usually after, I'm like, yes, you, you had a point, right? I don't, and, and you might sound, this is a small thing, but in my emotion, this is an issue. She wants to control me, you see? <laughs> oh. I had a fashion sense since I was, I was young, and now I met her, I'm in my 30s. Man, I had a fashion sense. But we, we, we are raw people. And I know this is a bit discouraging to say it over and over in our face. We are raw. We still have mercy, mess in our life. We still have the impatience. We still lie, we still cheat, we still were very selfish of, of, most of the time. And we need to admit to that. And I know most of the time, if I could ask you a question, don't give an answer, because you will discourage someone. If I could ask you, who is that one person in Mamilodi who is such a problem and very difficult to deal with? Most of you will probably pick someone who will sin differently than us. But the idea is, we're just sinners. We're just sinners. And there's a sense in it, if we want to grow, if we want to be the exemplary church that Paul is talking about, there's a sense in which we have to admit who we are. We, we are still a work in progress. I'm not saying this is all you would be, okay? I'm not saying this is all you would be. But stick in the church, read your Bible, grow into understanding this Jesus, that is holy, and you will begin to see a work of change. And the funny thing about change is that you never see it. You never see it. You might wake up one day and say, like, oh, there's a white hair here. But you never see it as like, oh, there's a white hair growing. It's growing now. You never see it. And it's like, uh, it's like uh, when we went home to the poor, there's mangoes. You never see them grow in your face. You just, they're there. You know, they grow. So let us understand that. So I want us to, what do we do now as we deal with the problem people? I think my time is almost finished. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. In fact, the New American Standard Bible, it says, we ask you, brothers, to appreciate those who labor among you. So I'm just going to mention five things that we need to work on as we are in the church. The first one is, we need to respect those who lead us. Some verses say, those who are in charge of us, our pastors. There, there are churches that are on the extreme where the pastor is like a god, all right? And then there's churches where the pastor is like your enemy, right? And by the power and the message of the Holy Spirit, Paul is asking, brothers, please live in peace with your pastors, all right? I think I'm going to be a bit quick here because my time is... We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor you who labor among you. There's a text. If someone can go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to go very quickly here. Colossians chapter 1. Verse, did I write that verse? 28 and 29. Who are these pastors of ours? Who are these pastors? Uh, someone is there? Is anyone there? Um, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. It says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone, and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within. Uh, if I can just put you on the spot there, given, what is Paul toiling about? Why is he laboring so much? What is, what is, what is it? Because toiling gives the idea of working to the point of exhaustion. Like he is tired every day, Paul. What is he doing according to Pilate? He wants to present everyone with choice. This is what the, 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 the pastors do. I get it, we are wrong. 
He wants the pastors, their job is to work with that raw material and to present us mature before God. Does that make sense? And that person who is there to help you deal with your rawness, the Bible says, come on, respect them. I know when the pastor comes to correct you about your life, it's not the nicest of things, right? You will feel like, hi, Mara, why, why is he pointing me? I've been doing my two million, I did the same thing. Therefore, we are with you now. Okay? We are with you. Don't make this difficult. In Titus, young men are warned not to be quarrelsome. It's, a, it's just a thing with young men to be quarrelsome. I remember when we were younger, when we <laughs> were starting to learn some theology, we had a disrespect for some of the older pastors that were teaching us. Because we're like, no, no, they're not presenting this gospel the right way. They're not presenting this message. Oh, my goodness. You know, uh, they say Calvinist in a cage. We, we were... We were so disrespectful. We, to a point that when, when, a, when a pastor is preaching the verse, the way that we don't see it, instead of saying, okay, after the message, I'm going to go and sit and talk to him about that because I didn't understand. No, no, we form groups and criticize him. And even if we hear that certain and certain a pastor is preaching, we're like, we're not going. The pride in the heart. Right? So please, man, um, our pastors have a lot to do. They have a responsibility to present us, present us mature before God. Not to say you don't, you don't make your case with the pastor. He's not a, a dictator. He's not a god. You could be wrong, right? But what the text is saying is that your spirit towards your pastor, it has to be about esteeming them in love. And that's going to be hard because of the raw material in our heart. I don't want us to raise a hand. Who here has ever fought with a pastor? Right. All right. Let's find the second thing that Paul is trying to get us to do. Verse, verse, verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idol. There's a whole... When you read Thessalonica, Paul, the idol basically is the lazy. Do you know that verse where it says, the lazy shall not eat? Is from this book. There's a level of laziness that Paul is confronting. Imagine you are wrong. And like, for example, the players by Chelsea that I gave an example, they're raw. The talent is there, but they're raw. Imagine they're like, ah, we're no longer Jimmy. We don't need a coach to show us how to work these things out. What would happen? That would get worse, right? And we, the fans, we will feel it, right? A lot of what Kaiser Chiefs uh, supporters go through, right? I don't want to start a beef, but I'm trying to emphasize that idleness always affects the community. Imagine if Uvusi there and Noah just wake up and say, ah, we're not going to do a list of songs here. We, we want to rest, right? Brothers, the growth of the church will always be affected by the effectiveness of the people inside it. And we need to own that responsibility for Christ. Amen, church? Amen. All right. I have a key word now, uh, raw. Okay. What is the other thing that Paul is saying? So we need to admonish the idol. So if we find someone who is idle and lazy, we need to admonish them, to give a word of correction. No, when you're not reading your scripture, brother, you need to pick up. It's going to affect you, and it's going to affect the whole body. All right? Encourage the faint-hearted. There's also another group in the church. They're called the faint-hearted. All right? I think there's there's a place here in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse 11, where Paul was talking about 
he was encouraging the Thessalonian to walk in a manner with him. So the, who are these faint-hearted? These are people that are in the church, but they are easily discouraged. Easily discouraged. We do a Bible study, and we're both very happy at the end. Uh, the next thing they just go, ah, now I'm no longer coming to church. I easily discouraged, easily depressed. Something happens in their life, they're like, ah, you know. What do they need? So, and also to know the faint hearted, you need to be in the church to know it. We need to be gentle with them, you know. You need to know your way to navigate around each other. Some people, if you speak too harshly to them, they you 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 you, you hurt them. They're fragile. And Paul says, uh, encourage them. I think there's another group here that Paul wants to to. He says, help the weak. Who are the weak? They need help. Help is literally like someone who is sitting. You need to lift them. These are the people that are easily, uh, they're susceptible to sin. Sin is very easy to pull them, you know. Uh, Patrick, one of our pastors, used to make an example. He says, there are people who, if they just hear a radio, they're gone. And you're like, are we were saying, Jeff, you're going to finish in prayer. Jeff is gone. Why? He heard a sound that's over there. It's easily, easily pulled by sin, right? And Paul says we need to help them. We need to be involved in the church. Let me finish. And the last one I think is the hardest, I think, for all of us. Maybe my personality struggles with this. Um, help the weak. Be patient with all men. Be patient with, sorry, with them all. It could be that group, or maybe someone else not even listed in the group. But for the unity and the growth of the church, and for us to be an exemplary church, we need to be patient with every man. Come on, let's lower the standards that we have and we want to uh, throw them on people's shoulders. Be patient with all men. Some years ago, I had a very sad example. There was a, I was staying in Pretoria there, uh, Okay, what is that park next to Bosman? There's a park there. Yes, Beggars Park. I was staying next to Beggars Park. And this, this flat that we're staying, it was huge. It had so many rooms. And in one of the rooms, there was a guy. He was a father. And at one of the times, his wife visited him with their child. The child was still maybe probably one year or somewhere there, very young. The child couldn't walk. And I remember one night, the child was crying. And you know, Renal, uh, we wanted to find out what is going on. So we went there, because we know the guy. So we went there, and what we found out was that the guy was forcing this child to walk. He was very serious about it. He was holding a stick. He's like, walk. I think the baby name was Sambul. Sambul, walk. And one of the mustanders came and was like, no, he's a baby, he can't walk. He's like, no, 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 he's been stubborn. He must walk. And it was such a sad example. This, this child, he can't walk. But give him some time, he will do it. In fact, the minute he starts walking, you'll be like, Ish, I wish he did it. Because it will be all over the place. We need to learn the patience to, with one another. Very quick to level one another. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that people that we have to be patient with one another are not going to frustrate us. They will. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not dismissing your frustration as if it's, it's immaturity. No, no, the frustration is real. They will frustrate you for real. And the things they do are frustrating. Amen, church? Amen. They will frustrate you. In church, it could be very easy to start some circles 
It's like, okay, Rusi and Noah and Pumi, we roll together. I go, boom, boy, they, they are a problem. So we're a church that rolls together in groups. And we start this little centers and group and whatever that we're doing because we are refusing in our hearts to be patient with one another. There's a text here that I want us to, to see. I think I'm going to finish so that we get an idea. He says in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, We also thank God constantly for this. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of man, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. That is a, a very encouraging thing. The gospel is also working in our hearts. It's not like we're just trying to make this effort on our own. There's a work that the Spirit is doing in our heart to keep us encouraged. To give an example, one day we will come here and let's say Jeff, I can make an example of him, uh, he's not going to chase me after church. Jeff comes and he frustrates me. Right? I can go away, trust the Lord, pray about it with the Lord, and still come back. Right? And trust the Lord to work among us. So, the gospel is creating the church. The church God brings all these people that do not look like us. I don't think all of us who are sitting here ever thought that one day we will sit together like this. When we were <laughs> still back in Malibu, a friend of mine used to say, yes, it's always interesting for me to see new people come to church. Because I'm always like, who is God going to bring up there? You know? And they're going to come and they're going to come with your issues, right? They will be raw. I feel like doing what uh, 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 pastors do in, 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 in crusades. We are raw. Can we say we are raw? Yeah. We are a work in progress. We are not as amazing as we think. Okay? I'm not trying to put you down. We are nice people. Uh, I'm looking at Tubi back there, one of the nicest people I know. But we are all wrong. We still have areas in our life that we need to work on. So that means, uh, all that I'm saying to say, don't be surprised when other people come to you and say, I'm oh, Aaron Jeff, that didn't sit well with me. In fact, I heard someone say, when you see another brother fall into sin, you just said, oh, by the grace of God, there goes I. And what that means is, it's just the grace of God that that person who fell into sin is not me. Because I'm just as close to falling to sin as everyone else. And as we look at these people that we need to help, that we need to encourage, that we need to warn, please don't start giving people names or when I need to be warned. No, all of us, all of us, we fall into these little boxes every now and then. One morning, it is us who is struggling with sin. We are so prideful, we can't even apologize, right? One morning it is us who feel so discouraged, we don't even want to go to church. We need someone to encourage us. One morning it is us who have been very patient with others. So this is not a, a category of people. This is all of us in the life of the church. Amen, Amen. But let us be encouraged that the gospel who started the work of conversion is, is working, is going. Paul even said that that's what ministers are doing. We will eventually stand before Christ, blameless and without sin. We will one day, brothers. There's a day that we will stand before God without sin. And we'll be like, I used to be wrong, but now I'm perfect because of Christ. And that perfection is not something that you achieve. It's something that Jesus is going to give you. In Philippians, we're even told that God will give us new bodies that are not susceptible to sin. That has no rawness. 
So be encouraged, brothers. Let's take a journey together. We are all not as amazing as we think. Let's walk together. Don't be super shocked when you see some of my sins. I'm raw. I have issues. Okay? I have issues. I wish, I wish uh, when you get married, we just say to one another, by the way, I have issues and you have issues. Let's just admit. So let's not fight when you see me going this way and that way. But it's not going to happen like that. We just take one day at a time and we feel those things every day. And all those things remind us that we need to trust something outside of ourselves, which is the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Good behavior is not gonna, it's not gonna take the rawness out of us. It will take admonition, it will take help, it will take encouragement, it will take the word of God working in our heart. The help that we need is outside of ourselves. Okay? Because we can think, oh, I just need to get my house in order, and then I'll go to church. This is why we end up pretending in church. Because you feel like you need to appear a certain way. You know? And then people are doing certain stuff. You are even afraid to say, I don't really like that. Because you think you will be leveled. Because you are trying to present this person. So let go of all that pressure. The work of change is done by the Spirit through the Word. And it will take community. It will take other believers. God is wise. When he saved us, he didn't allow us to be an island. That is also a footnote to say, please come to church all the time. Okay? He didn't create us to an island. He created a community around us. And I know that as believers, we struggle with this thing. We struggle to care for one another. Jeff was saying, we need to check on each other. We struggle. Okay? But God is working among us. And that's the thing. What is the thing that will make us an exemplary church? Admit our sinfulness. Know that God is working, is building his church through the gospel. And trust on resources that are outside of ourselves. And allow God to bring people in our life to talk to us. Amen? Amen. Alright, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you in Christ our Lord. Thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, that uh, you continue to work on us. There is nothing we can do if it is not by your power. We need you, Father, to, to work on us, to convert us, to um, have us mature and to be more like Jesus Christ. Help us to be honest with ourselves and with each other. Help us to know that there are still issues in our life. Help us to be honest. Help us to speak where we need help. But through it all, Father, we ask you to help us to continue to communicate, pray, seek you for the difficulties that we face in our life. In Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.